Welcome to Crime, Corruption, and Cocktails, the true crime podcast where we look at cases of corruption and negligence and examine their historical and cultural implications. Today, I'm drinking a sparkling cider. How about you, Jenny? I'm drinking Captain and Ginger Ale, and on today's episode, we'll explore the infamous story of Lorena Bobbitt and her husband, John. This case made worldwide headlines in the 90s and divided the country as well as men and women. So everyone is aware this case will feature talk of domestic violence and rape and sexual assault. Lorena Bobbitt was born Lorena Lenore Gallo in Bouquet, Ecuador in 1969. She grew up in Caracas, Venezuela with two younger siblings. Her father worked as a dental technician and the family led a middle class lifestyle. Lorena knew she wanted to move to the United States after visiting on a trip for her quinceanera. In 1987, she obtained a student visa and moved to the U.S. To earn money, she worked as a nanny and later took a position at a nail salon. A year later, she met John Bobbitt, a U.S. Marine, at a nightclub. They married on June 18, 1989, when Lorena was 20 and John was 22. Lorena said John became violent shortly after their marriage began. John hit Lorena for the first time after she complained about him driving dangerously after leaving a bar. The abuse continued and was both physical and sexual in nature. She alleged that John would force himself on her sexually after physically abusing her. John and Lorena would often fight about John's spending habits and having guests stay at their apartment without any notice. Lorena admits to hitting John only after he began beating her. In addition, Lorena said John would call her ugly and claim no other man would ever treat her right or want her. At some point during their marriage, Lorena became pregnant, and according to her, John forced her to get an abortion. She also stated that at the clinic, he taunted her about how the procedure would kill her. Police were called to the Bobbitt home half a dozen times, and in February 1991, John pleaded guilty to assault and battery though the charges were dismissed after he went through counseling. That same year, John left the Marines and Lorena's work at the nail salon became the couple's only income. Lorena would later admit to stealing from her employer in order to help pay the mortgage for the home she and John bought, and to shoplifting clothing so she could improve her appearance and deter John from cheating on her. Lorena and John separated in 1991, but reunited just a year later. In April 1993, they moved into a new apartment in Manassas, Virginia, but the abuse continued. Lorena planned to record John abusing her to help her get a divorce. When John found the tape recorder in her purse, he destroyed the cassette and pushed, hit, kicked, and raped Lorena. A doctor recommended she contact a domestic violence hotline, and the hotline suggested Lorena get a protective order against John. On June 21, 1993, Lorena began the process of filing for a protective order. She filled out the papers, but was told it would be three hours before she could pick them up. She decided to leave and return the following day. Not wanting to stay at the courthouse alone, she returned to her apartment. The following are Lorena's accounts of events on the night of June 23, 1993. She claimed that John came home drunk and raped her. After the attack, she spotted a knife when she went into the kitchen. In that moment, Lorena said she was feeling scared and physically and emotionally hurt. She then returned to their bedroom where John was sleeping and cut off his penis. She'd later tell Vanity Fair magazine, quote, I was thinking many things. I was thinking the first time he hit me. I was thinking when he raped me. I was thinking so many things, just really quick. I don't know. I just wanted him to disappear. I just wanted him to leave me alone, to leave my life alone. I don't want to see him anymore. End quote. Lorena, still holding the knife and the severed organ, then drove away from their apartment building. She tossed the penis into a field before ending up at a friend's house. At her friend's urging, Lorena contacted the police and told them where she had thrown the penis. John described how he felt a pulling on his groin and after that, she cut it off. Police located the penis, and John was able to have a successful reattachment surgery. While John was in surgery for over nine hours, Lorena was having a rape kit examination in the same hospital. Both John and Lorena were soon arrested. John denied allegations of abuse during their marriage and claimed he couldn't remember if they had sex the night 
of the 23rd and that he often had sex while he slept. In his version of events, Lorena was extremely jealous and the one who hit him. If he struck her, it was while protecting himself. His attorney stated that terminating Lorena's pregnancy was a mutual decision. John claimed that he denied Lorena's sexual advances on the night of June 23rd, and the reason Lorena was so upset was because he planned to divorce her, putting her green card and ability to become a United States citizen at risk. Lorena denied that her marriage took place because she wanted to stay in the country. She told Vanity Fair magazine, quote, I thought John was very handsome, blue eyes, a man in a uniform, you know? He was almost like a symbol, a Marine fighting for the country. I believed in this beautiful country. I was swept off my feet. I wanted my American dream, end quote. John's trial for marital sexual assault began in November of 1993. Though Lorena had accused him of rape, at the time, Virginia law required couples to be living separately or for serious physical injuries to have occurred for a charge of marital rape. The case only focused on evidence from the five days immediately preceding the mutilation. John was found not guilty due to lack of evidence. Lorena's trial began in January of 1994. She was charged with malicious wounding, which put her at risk for up to 20 years behind bars and possible deportation from the United States. Paul Ebert, who had served as the prosecutor in John's case, was now prosecuting Lorena. One of her defense attorneys, Lisa Kimber, told the jury, quote, the evidence will show that in her mind, it was his penis from which she could not escape that caused her the most pain, the most fear, the most humiliation. At the end of this case, you will come to one conclusion, and that is that a life is more valuable than a penis, end quote. During the televised proceedings, Lorena testified that her husband had raped and hit her throughout their marriage. Her defense team argued that she had been tormented by years of abuse and driven temporarily insane, and that in slicing off her husband's penis, she had been subject to, quote, irresistible impulse, end quote. Lorena testified that she had not realized what she had done until she was driving away from their home. John testified that he had never committed any acts of violence against his wife. However, other witnesses corroborated that Lorena had appeared with bruises and stated that John had been seen hitting and shoving his wife. Friends of John said under oath that they had heard him express a liking for forced sex. 44 witnesses, including three mental health professionals, verified the mental, sexual, and physical abuse Lorena had been subjected to, noting that she was clinically depressed and showing symptoms of PTSD. The prosecution's case included a statement Lorena had given to police in which she said, quote, he's always had an orgasm and he doesn't wait for me to orgasm. I don't think it's fair, so I pulled back the sheets then and did it, end quote. She later stated that the interview was inaccurate because she didn't have a translator present and was still learning English. There was a circus-like atmosphere outside of the courtroom. Feminists and Hispanic groups showed their support to Lorena and hoped this case would shed light on domestic violence. Many neighbors of the couple also took Lorena's side and described John as, quote, arrogant and, quote, a dog, who essentially got what was coming to him. Some even claim John described the attack as the best thing that ever happened to him because he was going to become rich and famous. On January 21st, 1994, a jury of seven women and five men found Lorena not guilty due to temporary insanity. Following the acquittal, she was sent to a hospital for a 45-day psychiatric evaluation, as required by Virginia state law, after which she was released. Activists applauded the sentence, and the vice president of the National Organization for Women said, quote, We're glad the jury rejected the twisted argument that a battered woman should be locked up in a prison cell, end quote. The prosecutor, Paul Ebert, was obviously not as pleased and said, quote, I have a certain amount of sympathy for Mrs. Bobbitt, but that doesn't justify what she did. A lot of people go to the penitentiary who in some ways tug at your heartstrings. But when you violate the law, you've got to be punished, in my opinion, and this is no exception, end quote. The Bobbitt's divorce was finalized in 1995. 
1994, John was convicted of misdemeanor domestic battery against his former fiance, Christina Elliott, and ordered to serve 45 days in jail, attend therapy, and join Alcoholics Anonymous. John capitalized on his 15 minutes of fame and became a porn star, acting in the adult films John Wayne Bobbitt Uncut and Frank and Penis. In 2003, he was charged with battery involving his wife at the time, Joanna Farrell. He now lives in Las Vegas, has been married three times, including his marriage to Lorena, and is currently single. To the surprise of many, Lorena stayed in Manassas, Virginia after the trial. She told the New York Times, quote, I live here. This is my home. Why should he have the last laugh? End quote. She became a U.S. citizen in the summer of 1994. In 1997, Lorena was charged with assaulting her mother, but the charges were later dropped. Lorena has generally kept a low profile since the trial ended. She accepted money for some appearances in South America, but has said she rejected the $1 million offered to her by Playboy magazine to pose. To earn a living, she worked as a cosmetologist, an administrative assistant, and a real estate agent. While attending Northern Virginia Community College after her trial, Lorena met David Bellinger and began a romantic relationship. Lorena and David never married, but welcomed their daughter Olivia in 2005. In 2007, Lorena created the Lorena Gallo Foundation to help victims of domestic violence and their children and to raise awareness of the issue. Lorena's violent action resulted in a whirlwind of media attention. Some women's rights activists thought the incident could lead to more awareness of domestic violence, but instead, the case became a tabloid sensation and fodder for comedians. It was literally called Bobbit Mania, and wait till you hear some of the stuff people were doing outside of the courthouse. A radio station was serving hot dogs and slice soda, chocolate penises and t-shirts with the slogan, Manassas, a cut above the rest, and love hurts, and boxers that said, don't cut me short, were available for purchase. Some magazine interviewed one of the people selling this stuff, and she said they made $20,000. Someone also said the Oscar Mayer Wiener Mobile was there. Pretty tacky, you know, to do this in my opinion. People were waiting outside of the courthouse at 6 a.m. to get seats inside to see what Lorena and John were going to say. This was televised by Court TV and the, I guess, head of Court TV later said he didn't really want to cover it because it was just kind of tabloid trash to him, but they did it anyway. And I don't really blame them because what a shocking case. Like, we haven't heard anything like that since or before that I know of. Dallas, can you think of anything? I can't, yeah. And I definitely understand why he didn't want to broadcast this. It's scandalous, it's salacious, but at the same time, it's a case that really intrigued the minds of everyone, whether that was through solidarity with Lorena or fear and hurt for John. Yeah, it really split the country uh, between what men were thinking and how women were feeling. And we'll talk about that in a second, but It also, I think, comes down to sex sells and makes for good TV. And John and Lorena were both pretty attractive people. I don't know how popular this case would have been if they weren't attractive, unfortunately. But I feel like it's up there as being like one of the crimes of the century, really. In addition to all of this, like we said, John was getting his 15 minutes of fame and he did plenty of talk shows. The surgeon that reattached his penis also did a lot of talk shows. The media was not portraying Lorena in the nicest light. They would call her crazy. They stereotyped her as a hot-blooded Latino woman. I find it so fascinating because a lot of these comedians were making fun of her. Um, She was like great material for late night talk show hosts. There was an SNL sketch about her and a made-for-TV musical. Everyone was kind of calling her like every man's nightmare, but at the same time, Playboy wanted her to pose for them. Right. And it's the thing. I can definitely see where they're coming from. She definitely is a man's worst nightmare. She did cut off a man's penis. But it was more so, I think, what she symbolized. The fact that that is possible. The fact that you can drive a human to do such mutilation to another person. I think that's what scared them the most. John's brother 
commented and he was quoted as saying that what Lorena did was worse than actually killing John because she took away the thing that means the most to a man, which I mean, I get it, but like, really, that's what means the most to you. That's like kind of embarrassing. I mean, I think it's how you connect to your identity. So for a man, you know, one way to prove his manliness, one way to prove who he is, is through that external organ. As a female, I don't understand it, but I definitely understand the want and desire to make sure that people respect your identity and how you display your masculinity, which for John and for a lot of men is through that outward power and it's through their penis. That's such a good way to say it. And power is exactly what it is. Society has really given this body part a lot of symbolic power. And even now, you can see headlines that focus solely on John's penis, his loss, how the penis is doing now, what does it look like, and any puns you can really think of. And I'm seeing this from TMZ and Inside Edition, but even like the Washington Post in the 90s did a whole write-up about the surgeons that were involved. Yeah, I will say that it's definitely a medical marvel what they were able to do. But it also comes with a very sleazy component because then he capitalized on that reconstruction surgery to go out and do porn. And speaking of sleaziness and I guess kind of helping John to capitalize is Howard Stern. Do you have any thoughts on him, Del? So Howard Stern is someone who, he's a shock jock. And I particularly don't like shock jocks that don't have any real messaging behind what they're saying. And for me, he just says things just to get a rise out of other people, just to show that he's edgy, just to show that he's a cut above the rest. He's worse. So I remember watching a couple of his things and he would have females on there. And it was some of the most sexist things I've ever heard someone say directly to someone else's face. And they were made to think that they owed him something. And so they would uncomfortably laugh along with all of the bullshit that he was saying to them. So I do not hold Howard Stern very highly in my mind. Neither do I. So for anyone that doesn't know, Howard Stern, like Dell said, is a shock jock. He's a morning radio show host. He got his start in the 90s being very bawdy, uh, a lot of women's groups accused him like Dell said of being sexist and misogynistic and I think he was kind of like a proud chauvinist I think he has said since that he regrets some of the stuff he's done I'm by no means defending him because I'm also not a fan but he was like John's number one supporter he held a benefit to help with John's medical bills and he helped him get a penis enlargement as well and he repeatedly made disparaging comments about Lorena I have a select few for you that I will read. So he has said about Lorena, she didn't want to leave him. So, you know, let me tell you something. She must have really liked it if she didn't want to leave him so bad. I don't even buy that John was raping her. She's not that good looking. No creep deserves what that psycho bitch did. And finally, a guy's whole life is his penis. That really sums up uh, Howard Stern. And how the media was really looking at this case. It really shows the depths that they went to to destroy her. Do I agree with what she did? Absolutely not. But there's one level of saying what she did was wrong and she should be punished for it. It's a whole nother thing to go on and call her a bunch of names and basically say that she deserved anything that happened to her and that John was the completely innocent victim. And while all of her accusations haven't been proven, there are several accusations that have, such as the ones that she was able to prove when he pled guilty and the ones that led to her getting protective order against him. And all of the people that she knew to back her up. These are John's friends. These are neighbors that can hear them fighting constantly in their apartment building. There are people that work at the apartment complex and see John constantly flirting with other women. I've heard his employers talk about how we didn't even know he was married because he was constantly trying to get dates from people coming into our restaurant. And acting 
like some of the neighbors said, a dog like that, he doesn't deserve to have his penis cut off either, but he is not an innocent party. Right. And there's also this very racial aspect that you touched on briefly before, where it was the hot-blooded Latina. What does her being a Latina have to do with anything? Why does it have to be that she is not responding to the abuse that she alleges that she received as a result of John? It's Latinas can't handle their temper. Latinas, they act crazy. Latinas this, Latinas that. It's like you could have eliminated a lot of the criticism, not all of it, but a lot of the criticism that you got against your coverage of her if you would have left out that aspect of it. Yeah, there's absolutely no need to mention that. And it's a gross stereotype that can be very harmful. And it can also deter people from seeking resources when it comes to domestic violence. The abuse of Lorena was often overlooked, like we said, for the sensational headlines about John's penis. A lot of people had asked the media to get the public to put themselves in Lorena's shoes and think what drove somebody to that level of desperation and to see her as a woman who was determined to never be raped again. She was being raped by her husband, the person that she should trust the most in the world, maybe. People were quoted as saying, the abuse of Lorena was ignored in favor of a narrative that celebrated male sexuality and shamed her for being a vengeful perpetrator instead of shining a light on domestic violence and abuse. And someone else said that the public was being entertained on the fodder of someone else's suffering, which Lorena knew. She's a very intelligent woman and she was hurt by what people were saying about her. She was wondering, why aren't they talking about my pain? Why is this a joke? She really thought people would take this more seriously. What do you think of how the media treated her, Del? And do you think that if this were to happen today, it would look at all the same? So I definitely agree that the way the media treated her was absolutely disgusting. And one of the things that I feel like they completely missed in their let's hold up John's penis was the fact that he was mutilated. And if you wanted to create a negative story around that, you could have. You could have said, this woman mutilated this man. But you didn't. You made jokes about it. You decided that she was crazy. You decided that we have these two attractive people. How big can we make this story? You had one or two choices. You could either break it down to a woman mutilates her husband in revenge, Or two, a domestic violence survivor fought her way out of a very traumatic situation. They went with a very ugly combination of crazy Latina cuts off man's penis because he looked at another woman. It's almost like the easy way out too. Instead of really asking the public to think and reflect and examine what we accept as a culture and to look at domestic and sexual violence. No, you just went for entertainment. The severity of the crime and Lorena's claims of physical and sexual abuse were ignored by many news outlets, like we're saying. Domestic violence wasn't talked about as openly in the 90s, and we do have to remember that is a factor in this case. It was 1993. Some of what we're about to talk about we did mention in our O.J. Simpson case. It's definitely worth it to talk about again, as domestic violence is still a very large issue in this country. Domestic violence was thought of as an issue between a couple that needed to be handled on their own. The women's movement in the 1970s and 80s had brought battered women to the attention of a nation just beginning to accept the idea of equality between the genders. The focus in those years, the 1970s and 80s, was mainly on shelters, building them, getting them funded, getting abused women away from their perpetrators. And a federal law against domestic violence wasn't passed in the U.S. until 1984. And that was the Family Violence and Prevention Act, which provided funds to shelters and resources to victims. And a lot of this changed in the 1990s because of the O.J. Simpson case. A lot of women felt like after seeing Nicole Simpson 
go through so much abuse. They felt like it could happen to them. If it happened to someone as rich and beautiful as Nicole, you know, it could be any one of us. And a lot of activists were upset that it did take a wealthy white woman getting murdered for people to really open their eyes. Victims suddenly began to access resources in unprecedented numbers and calls to domestic violence hotlines, shelters, and police skyrocketed after the case. And this case actually helped pass the Violence Against Women Act in 1994. Domestic violence was starting to be viewed as more of a criminal justice issue and not just a women's issue or a private matter that is just within a family. With the passage of the Violence Against Women Act, cities could now get federal funding to address domestic violence in their own communities. And funds allowed for targeted trainings of first responders, the creation of advocacy positions, shelters, and transitional housing, as well as batterer intervention classes and legal trainings. It also meant that victims no longer had to pay for their own rape kits, and if an abuse partner was evicted because of events related to her abuse, she could now receive compensation and assistance. The Violence Against Women Act did face some delays in getting reauthorized in 2013 because Republican senators and representatives didn't want the bill to specifically mention same-sex partners, Native Americans living on reservations, or undocumented immigrants who were battered and trying to apply for temporary visas. And to give people uh, some context, four out of ten non-Hispanic Black women, American Indian, or Alaskan Native women have been a victim of physical violence, rape, and or stalking by an intimate partner in their lifetime. To try to ignore these groups is disgusting. I also wanted to focus in on immigrant women for a second because Lorena was an immigrant woman and she said that she didn't know that there was an option to seek refuge in a shelter during her marriage. And she also said, quote, as an immigrant woman, I was often too scared to call the police for help. My abusive husband always threatened that he could have the police detain me and have me deported back to my country, end quote. And this threat of deportation is very real for immigrant women and women who are undocumented. The abusers can also threaten to have them separated from their children, which is a very scary reality for immigrant women. Married immigrant women experience higher levels of physical and sexual abuse than unmarried immigrant women do, and there are some unique barriers that immigrant women face, that being language, um, lack of knowledge of resources, and United States laws as well. And some women may come from a culture where domestic violence is more widely accepted and it's frowned upon to get assistance. So it's a, a very complex intersection. They also might not have access to bilingual shelters, financial assistance, or food. And we also have to consider that some of these women are hundreds, thousands of miles away from their families, and they don't really have a rooted support system around them. And that would have been uh, the case with Lorena. She was very close with her employer and some co-workers and family friends, but her parents were in another continent. Domestic violence is, I think, considered by some an epidemic, and we just wanted to mention that on average, nearly 20 people per minute are physically abused by an intimate partner in the United States, and during one year, this equates to more than 10 million women and men, and one in three women and one in four men have experienced some form of domestic violence by an intimate partner. In addition to domestic violence, this case publicly brought up the subject of marital rape for, I think, one of the first times, really. Marital rape is defined as a non-consensual sexual act between two people who are married. 10 to 14% of married women are raped by their husbands in the United States, and this is likely underreported. Women who are raped by their husbands are likely to be raped multiple times. And almost one in five female marital rape survivors say their children witnessed the assault. Survivors of spousal rape can experience post-traumatic stress disorder, 
disordered sleeping, sexual dysfunction, and emotional pain for several years after the violence. And we were already kind of seeing that with Lorena. Uh, She was shown to have post-traumatic stress disorder and clinical depression. And I think she was having, I guess this is kind of hand in hand with PTSD. It can be, I guess, a symptom of it. I believe she was having flashbacks and the violence she was experiencing really started to take a toll on her work and her health. Marital rape became a crime in all 50 states in 1993. At least a dozen states have loopholes that make prosecuting marital rape very difficult, and they have exceptions to the legality of marital rape. Many explicitly require the use of force. Some examples include that in Virginia, a husband can avoid criminal charges if he agrees to therapy, In South Carolina, a married victim only has 30 days to report the rape and has to prove the threat of physical violence, and the act must also involve a weapon or highly aggravated violence. In Idaho, marital rape laws only apply to husbands. A lot of the rationales for these exceptions is the view that wives are the property of their husbands, and Sir Matthew Hell, who is a 17th century jurist, said, quote, For the husband cannot be guilty of a rape committed by himself upon his lawful wife for their mutual matrimonial consent and contract. The wife hath given up herself in this kind unto her husband, which she cannot retract, end quote. We do have to remember, too, that rape isn't always about the sex. It is oftentimes about the power, too. We have two more recent examples and cases of marital rape and how these victims have tried to fight to change laws in their states. Jenny Thiessen fought to get Minnesota's loophole overturned after she found videos of her husband raping her after she had been drugged. In one video, she is being raped next to her sleeping four-year-old son. Jenny and her husband were in the process of a divorce at the time when she found the videos. Her husband's lawyer found this legal loophole in Minnesota. I think the loophole said something about that the married couple couldn't be living together at the time, which I believe was Virginia's loophole, if you want to call it that, for John and Lorena's case as well. So her husband's lawyer found this loophole when she tried to sue him and he was not charged with sexual assault, but just invasion of privacy. Mandy Boardman, who was from Indiana, her husband was sentenced to eight years of home detention despite being convicted of six felonies, including rape and deviant conduct. Mandy found videos of her husband raping her and recalled her husband drugging her and waking up with dissolved pills in her mouth or remembering her husband reaching for like little vials of liquid in their bedroom. A judge actually told Mandy to forgive her now ex-husband and said that he was a good dad. Which I don't know how you can defend those actions. And people tried to argue that, well, home detention is still incarceration, but What kind of message is that really sending? I don't think that it's sending a message at all. I think that while house arrest is definitely an applicable punishment in certain cases, if you've been convicted of six felonies, I think that you should be in prison. Exactly, 100%. I don't understand why you would let someone off like that. Mandy's case actually did cause a lot of controversy. It it made national news for just how ridiculous it was. And a lot of people called for the judge to resign. It's really, I would say like barbaric and just so, so outdated. Not that it ever would have been right to just think, okay, well, they're married. You know, a husband can't rape his wife, but it's 2021. And when Maryland's legal loophole was brought to, uh, I guess, the courts. Lawmakers were saying, okay, well, if someone gets patted on the butt and they didn't like that, is that then marital rape? No, it's not. It's just so infuriating to hear people make these excuses. Yeah, it all goes back to the language of the law. And one of the things that I've seen argued was why does marital rape have to be a second crime if you have other statutes on the books that criminalize rape. And while I do understand that argument, a crime is a crime, I think that it speaks to the motivation for the crime, which, like we've said before, it's power, it's control, it's that onus that you feel like you have over your partner, and that's why it's a separate crime. 
And like you said, the laws are specified in a way where the language is very analogous to a standard rape charge. It's not a thing that says that any sexual contact within a marriage that you don't like will then be deemed as rape. It's just saying that if you take steps beyond no to continue to engage in sexual activity, that is now a crime. Yeah, it, to me, it's really as simple as that. And I guess, like, as lawmakers, they do need to consider, you know, the extremes of things, but just come on. While there are definitely false rape allegations, and I'm not excusing those, I feel like they happen at such a low frequency that it's not enough to throw out the entire law simply because a few bad actors abuse it. I 100% agree. I think it's something like less than 2% of rape accusations are false. And the fact that we want to focus on these false rape accusations constantly, I feel like it's kind of putting us back. It's a balancing act. It's one of those things where a false rape allegation definitely, for me, diminishes real rape allegations that happen because you never want someone to be able to say, well, you're just like this other person that falsely accused this person of rape. For example, when the Brett Kavanaugh situation was happening, I found it very troubling that additional women were hopping on the bandwagon of accusing him of rape, despite knowing that they were lying, because that diminishes what Christine Blasey Ford was saying. And I'm not saying that he did it. I'm not saying I agree with her account of the events. I'm just saying that the false accusation made it way easier for people to believe that Christine Blasey Ford was lying. I agree, unfortunately. I mean, we've talked about this so many times because of these false rape accusations and everyone wanting to question victims and survivors. That is why a lot of people don't come forward with their stories until 20 some years later, like in that case, when they finally feel secure enough, or, you know, they see this man getting applauded so much, their attacker, whoever getting applauded so much, that they think like, I cannot let this stand anymore. And at that point, it's too late. The only thing that you can accomplish at that point is destroying the reputation of the person. It's not going to be any real legal consequences. And the longer you wait, the less that you have evidence to actually prove your case, which was the case with Christine Blasey Ford, where she didn't have any evidence to prove her case. She didn't have any witnesses. And the one witness that she claimed to have wasn't willing to actually step forward and testify. So it became a he said, she said situation, which we always hear about in these type of cases. And in this case, it was used claiming that someone who had been a respected jurist and someone who had been so accomplished that they were being nominated for the Supreme Court, you were accusing him of sexual assault. And that is a huge hill to climb. And in this case, she wasn't able to climb it. We've talked about this before, but sexual assault and rape is one of the few crimes where everyone's character really comes into play for whatever reason. Um, I don't think it's right at all. You mentioned too a lot of time passing and lack of evidence. We see that a lot of people accused of rape do end up getting acquitted because it is unfortunately, like you're saying, with the language of our laws, rape and sexual assault are hard things to prove unless there is very clear evidence or witnesses, anything like that. And so many things get turned into a he said, she said. I mean, Lorena and John's case was a he said, she said, essentially. We wanted to touch real quick on the battered women syndrome and the temporary insanity defense and acquittal, I guess you could say Lorena got. She was found not guilty by temporary insanity and said she was shown to have battered woman syndrome. And this was due to the PTSD she was facing. And after her time in the psychiatric facility, it was proven that she was suffering from battered woman syndrome. The battered woman syndrome is a defense used by women who argue that their only means of escaping life-threatening abuse is to kill their abuser, um, in this case, mutilating Lorena's husband. We talked about the psychological effects of abuse, the PTSD, the anxiety, depression, other emotional suffering, 
And I think battered woman syndrome can kind of be described as someone snapping almost. There's only so much abuse some people can take before they have to act out on that. And some examples of battered woman's syndrome defenses are in 1977, Michigan housewife Francine Hughes poured gasoline on her husband's bed as he slept and set it on fire, killing him. Hughes, who had suffered years of abuse, was found not guilty by reason of insanity. So pretty similar to Lorena. There was also Barbara Sheehan. She was acquitted of second degree murder after having shot her husband 11 times in their New York State home. She testified she had suffered repeated abuse during their relationship. The day she shot him, she said that she had refused to go to Florida with him, which angered him to the point where he threatened to kill her and pointed a gun at her head. And while he was shaving, she shot him using two of his own guns. And like we said, Barbara was acquitted of second degree murder, but she was found guilty of gun possession. And we wanted to end on the legacy of Lorena and John's case. People are still talking about them over 25 years later, and the way the media handles this case now is much different than it originally did in the 90s. John still denies claims of abuse and says if anything, he would try to subdue and restrain Lorena from hitting and punching him. He told Good Morning America that their fighting was not spousal abuse. And Lorena claims that John still sends her love letters and Valentine's cards and I think maybe messages online as well. An interesting quote I saw in relation to this case was 30,000 women die at the hands of their romantic partners each year and we are still uncertain as to what consent means. One white, straight, cisgender man loses his cock and we talk about it for 25 years, which I think kind of sums up this case pretty well. And with that is the idea that Lorena is a hero to a lot of people out there. I have some quotes from a Vice article, say what you will about Vice, but I thought this um, thought piece was pretty interesting. And the writer said, quote, Lorena didn't just cut off a man's dick. She disarmed him of the weapon he had repeatedly used to humiliate, subjugate, and harm her. On some level, This was and remains terrifying to the patriarchy and quietly empowering to the women who suffer under it, end quote. After her acquittal, her boss at the nail salon read a statement saying that Lorena did once and will again seek her American dream when she is able, and if the publicity of her abuse can help one person find freedom, then all of this is not in vain. So I think that those are pretty good statements as to why people are so fascinated by her and relate to Lorena and really applaud her actions. She sent a message to abusers and men at large, but she was still saying she hopes that she can help other victims find freedom and get the help they need. But some people did not agree With this, Richard Siegel, who was a composer that actually wrote a song about Lorena, he said, I was angered by the fact that Lorena was becoming a folk hero. And Lorena has been mentioned in many songs around the time of the crime and since her uh, acquittal. Uh, Weird Al did a parody of a song and mentioned Lorena in it. I think Eminem has mentioned her in his lyrics as well. Um, But so, what do you think of this? Do you think? Lorena is a hero. What are your thoughts? Absolutely not. I do not think that you can be called a hero for mutilating someone else, irregardless of the reason. We don't hell up people that killed in self-defense as heroes, and I don't think that she should be held up as a hero. I absolutely agree with Richard Siegel and the fact that people propped her up as this anti-patriarchal person when in reality she is an example of what you shouldn't do because if we're trying to give the message of if you are abused leave if you are abused we have resources for you the last thing you want to do is hell up someone that didn't do that the last thing you want to do is hold up someone that took matters into her own hands and that could have went really bad for john I don't think people talk about that enough. The fact that he survived and he was able to get his penis reattached is a miracle. He could have bled out. She could have missed and nicked an artery. 
anything could have happened and then we would have a dead person on our hands because of her actions, because of the fact that she didn't walk away. So when you hear that the only reason why she went back to the apartment is because she couldn't wait three hours, that rubs me the wrong way. Because if you're telling me you were in such a bad emotional place that you had to mutilate someone else, then I feel that you could have waited three hours for the paperwork that would have protected you from him. So no, she's not a hero. I think that there are other people that have been actually victimized that people should be looking to for inspiration. Anita Hill, Monica Lewinsky, I think those are great examples of women who were in a very similar spot where they were being abused. And similar to Lorena, their name was being dragged through the mud in the media and they were being made out to be these vicious, vindictive women, but they didn't mutilate anyone. They handled it with tact and grace. And I don't think Lorena did. Those are all really good points, Del. And Lorena, I think, would agree with you. She has said herself she's not a hero. I struggle a little. I don't think her action of mutilating her husband would make her a hero at all. I don't want to you know, applaud anyone for violence. But I think the fact that she did survive abuse and she's gone on to create her foundation and to help raise awareness and bring resources to victims is means for her to be a hero. And I think to a lesser degree, the fact that, like you said, the public dragged her name through the mud. And to me, she never gave in and gave them what they wanted simply like how John did. He really capitalized on that 15 minutes of fame. But Lorena didn't. She kept a low profile. She went on with her life. I really respect that aspect. Anyone that is doing work to help women that have been abused, I applaud them. I just hope that through the work that she's doing, she has found better ways of coping with emotional trauma and finding different ways to resolve interpersonal conflict. I obviously don't know her, but I would say that it has affected her somehow and she's definitely grown. The way she articulates what was going through her mind when she did attack John is so interesting to hear. It shows like this loss of control and how the only thing on her mind was her suffering and how she just wanted him out of her life. I mean, no one can really say you know, what you would be thinking after someone violated you and had been violating you for years. Last year, a docu-series called Lorena that was produced by Jordan Peele came out and it focused on how she was uh, very mistreated by the public. And it seems to be a common thing that's happening now. We're seeing people take a look back at these scandals, particularly scandals from the 90s, and reflecting on maybe we shouldn't have talked about this person this way. And you know what? They were actually a victim and we didn't paint them that way. You had mentioned Anita Hill and Monica Lewinsky. I haven't seen these documentaries, but there are documentaries on their cases and how they were scrutinized and defamed. And to this day, people don't know the real events of their lives. And in some cases, they're suffering. Um, Tanya Harding as well. These victims, I guess you could say, are really getting a chance to tell more so their side of the story. Have you seen any of the documentaries? So I've watched the ones on Anita Hill and Monica Lewinsky, just because they're definitely inspirations for me when thinking about how to deal with adverse situations, how to keep your head held high when it seems like a pile of dirt is constantly being thrown at you and people are not holding you or your name in any type of high regard or respect. So I've watched things on them, not so much Tanya Harding besides the original situation that happened with her and Nancy Kerrigan. I was lucky enough to hear um, Anita Hill speak a few years ago. She's so powerful. She's such a, a wonderful person who has really, I would say, stayed true to herself throughout this whole thing. And a few years ago, I guess that was really when my eyes were open to the Monica Lewinsky, Bill Clinton thing. And I heard somewhere Monica Lewinsky say like I was young and the most powerful man in the world was telling me I'm pretty and he's interested in me and showing me all this attention and I related to that so much 
to feel people aren't really recognizing you and then the one person that's going to recognize you and validate you is the president who wouldn't be attracted to that that wraps up this week's case thank you for listening let us know what you think in the comments about Lorena Bobbitt is she a hero and did she get a fair sentence make sure you click the subscribe button you can find us on your favorite podcast platform and YouTube every Wednesday with a new episode Follow us on Instagram at Crime Corruption Cocktails and on Twitter at Charade Inc. Please consider donating to our Patreon. This will help us get better equipment and bring higher quality content to you. We appreciate any amount you can give. This is Jenny and Dale signing off. Stay safe.